The Wonder of Swedes by R. K. Narayan Chapter 1 Conquer taste and you'll have conquered the self, said Jagan to his listener, who asked, Why conquer the self? Jagan said, I do not know, but all our sages advise us so. The listener lost interest in the question. His aim was only to stimulate conversation while he occupied a low wooden stool next to Jagan's chair. Jagan sat under the framed picture of the goddess Lakshmi hanging on the wall and offered prayers first thing in the day by reverently placing a string of jasmine on top of the frame. He also lit an incense stick and stuck it in a crevice in the wall. The air was charged with the scent of jasmine and incense and imperceptibly blended with the fragrance of sweet meats frying in ghee in the kitchen across the hall. The listener was a cousin, though how he came to be called so could be could not be explained since he claimed cousinhood with many others in the town but if challenged he could always overwhelm the skeptic with genealogy he was a man about town and visited many places and houses from morning till night and invariably every day at about 4:30 he arrived through a brief glance and a nod at Jorgen passed straight into the kitchen and came out ten minutes later wiping his mouth with the end of a towel on his shoulder, commenting, The sugar situation may need washing. I hear the government is going to raise the prices. Wheat flour is all right today. I gave that supply a bit of my mind yesterday when I passed go down street. Don't ask me what took me there. I have friends and relations all over this city and everyone wants me to attend to this or that. I do not grudge serving others. What is life worth unless we serve and help each other? Jagan asked, did you try the new sweet the cook experimented with today? Yes, of course. It is tasty. Oh, I think it is only an old recipe in a new shape. All sweet meats, after all, are the same. Don't you agree? No, sir, said the cousin. I still see a lot of difference between one sweet and another. I hope I shall not become a yogi and lose the street, lose the taste for all. It was then that Jagan pronounced his philosophy, conquer test, and you will have conquered the self. They chattered thus for half an hour more. And then Jagan asked, Do you know what I eat nowadays? Anything new? asked the cousin. I have given up salt since this morning. Jagan said it with a glow of triumph. He felt satisfied with the effect produced and expanded his theory. One must eat only natural salt. What is natural salt? asked the cousin and added, The salt that dries on one's back when one has run a mile in the sun. Jagan made a right face at the coast reference. He had the outlook of a soul disembodied floating about the grim of this earth. At fifty-five his appearance was light and elfish, his brown skin was transient, his brow receded gently into the walnut shade of baldness and beyond the fringe his hair fell in a couple of speckled waves on his neck. His chin was covered with widening bristles as he shaved only at certain intervals, fearing that to be oneself daily in a mirror was intolerable European habit. 
He wore a loose jibba over the dhoti, over his dhoti, both made of material spun with his own hand. Every day he spun for an hour and produced enough yarn for his ha- such oral requirements. He never possessed more than two sets of clothes at any one time and he delivered all the excess yarn in neat bundles to the local handloom committee in exchange for cash. Although the cash he thus earned was less than five rupees a month, he felt a sentimental thrill in receiving it as he had begun. The hurried when Gandhi visited the town over twenty years ago and he had been commanded for it. He wore a narrow almond shaped pair of glasses set in a yellowish frame and peeped at the world over their pale rim. He grabbed his shoulders in a collar shawl with gaudy yellow patterns on it and he shod his feet with thick sandals made of the leather of an animal which had died of old age. Being a follower of Gandhi, he explained, I do not like to think that a living creature should have its throat cut for the comfort of my feet, and this occasionally involved him in excursions to remote villages where a cow or calf was reported to be dying. When he secured the hide, he soaked it in some solution and then turned it over to an old cobbler he knew, who had his little repair shop under a tree in the Albert Mission compound. When his son was six years old, he was a happy supporter of Jargon's tanning activities in the back veranda of the house. But as he grew older, he began to complain of the stench whenever his father brought home leather. Jargon's wife proved even less tolerant than the son. She shut herself in a room and refused to come out until the tanning ended, since it was a prolonged process carried on over several days, one can understand the dislocation into which the household was thrown whenever Jargon attempted to renew his footwear. It was a difficult and arduous operation. The presence of the ladder at home threatened to blast his domestic life. He had to preserve it. In the early stages of turning out of his wife fresh in the full shed where there was danger of rats nibbling it. When she lay dying, she summoned Jargon to come closer to her and mumbled something. He could not make out her words but was harrowed by the thought that probably she was saying, throw away the ladder. Indifference to what was possibly her last wish, he did not. He did give away the last bit of leather at home to a mission and felt happy that he was enabling someone else to take to nonviolent footwear. Afterwards, he just trusted the cobbler at the Albert Mission to supply his rather complicated footwear. Now, his cousin's reference to natural salt upset his delicate balance and he reddened in the face. The cousin, satisfied with the effect he had produced, tried to restore his mood with a pleasing remark. You have simply perfied your life so completely and made yourself absolutely self-dependent, as I was saying to the cooperative registrar the other day. This had the desired effect and Chagun said, I have disc- 
continued sugar. As you know, I find 20 drops of honey in hot water quite adequate and this is the natural way of taking in sugar we need. You have perfected the art of living on nothing, said the cousin. Encouraged, Jargon added, I have given up rice too. I cook a little stone ground wheat and take it with honey and grains. And yet, said the cousin, I cannot understand why you go on working and earning, taking all this trouble. He waved his hand in the direction of the sweet displayed on trays at the window but stopped short of asking why Jargon should expect others to eat sweets and keep him flourishing. He felt he had said enough and stood in his seat. Jargon's counting hour was approaching and the cousin knew he should move as Jargon did not like sea cash to be washed. The time was six. The peak sellers were over and the front stall boy would be bringing in the main collection for the day. At this moment, Chagan almost f fancied himself a monarch on a throne serving his people and accepting their tributes. The throne was a flat-bottomed wooden chair covered with a thin cushion hoisted on a pat platform strategically placed so that he could keep an eye on all sides of his world of confections. The chair was nearly a century old with shining brass strips on the arms and back and carved legs specially made by his father when he built his house beyond the lovely statue. Normally, he would not have bothered to design a piece of furniture as the family always sat on a polished floor, but he had frequent visits from, the, from a Mr. Noble, an Englishman, the district collector, who came for lessons in astrology and found it painful to sit on the floor and even more painful to extricate himself from the sitting posture at the end of the lesson. A side portrait ripening yellow with time was among the prized positions dumped in the loft. But at some point in the history of the family, the photograph was brought down. The children played with it for a while and then stopped, substituted in the glass frame the picture of a god and hung it up. While the photograph in the bell mount was tossed about as the children gazed on Mr. Noble's side, whiskers and giggled all the afternoon. They fanned themselves with it too when the summer became too hot. Finally, it appeared back to the loft amidst all account books and other obscure family junk. Sitting there, Jargon was filled with a sense of fulfillment. On one side, he could hear, see, and smell whatever was happening in the kitchen, whereas a constant traffic of trays laden with colorful sweetmeats passed to the front counter. As long as the frying and zizzing, sizzling noise in the kitchen continued, and the trace passed, Jargon noticed nothing. His gaze unflinchingly fixed on the Sanskrit lines in red bounced copy of the Bhagavad Gita, but if there was the slightest pause in the sizzling, he cried out without lifting his eyes from the sacred text what is happening the hedge cook would give a rooting reply nothing and that would quieten jargon's mind 
and enable it to return to large settings until again some slackness was noticed at the front stall and he would shout captain the little girl in the yellow skirt asked her what she wants she has been standing there so long his shout would alert the counter attendant as well as the watchman at the door an ex-army man in khaki who had a tendency to doze off on his deal would sit or jargon would cry captain that beggar should not be seen here except on fridays this is not a charity home the surroundings were harsh when the master counted his earnings for the day although the boy at the front store received all the cash he was not supposed to know the total he just dropped every pesa he received into a long necked bronze jug and brought it in at six o'clock returned to his seat and brought in another installment in a smaller container at seven when the shutters were drawn Jogan would not count the cash yet but continued to read the Lord's sayings. Without looking up, he was aware that the frying had stopped. He noticed the hissing of the oven when the fire died out, the clinking of pans and ladles being washed, and then the footsteps approaching him four pairs of feet from the kitchen and one pair from the front stall as trays of leftover were brought in as the last act for the day then when he knew that all of them were assembled assembled to his desk he addressed in a general way a routine question how much is left over not much be exact two seals of miso pack that we can sell tomorrow she let be half a seal won't be so good tomorrow all right go the front stall boy carried in the leftover trays and unobtrusively made his exit the cook still awaited his permission to leave. Chagan asked, Are all the windows shut? Yes. Chagan now addressed himself to the head cook. Tomorrow, Najalabi. What is wrong with it? It bothered him to think of the leftovers. They rankled in his mind as if he had a splinter in his skull. He loved to see clean, shining trays return to the kitchen at the end of the day. A babble of argument followed. Chagan asked, What do we do with the leftovers? The head cook said, smoothly as usual, We will try a new suite tomorrow. If you will let me do it, there will be no problem of leftovers. We can always pulp everything but and frying them afresh in a new shape chagan said philosophical after all everything consists of flour sugar and flavors trying to come to a decision which he had been resisting all along but after all one had to take a practical view with the price of foodstuff going up when his staff was gone he put away his scripture book and pulled the drawer of his table half out it was padded with a fo folded towel in order to muffle the sound of coins being emptied from the bronze jack his fingers quickly sorted out the denominations the fives tens and quarters with a flourish of the virtual saw running his fingers over the keyboard. His eyes swept the collection at a glance and arrived at the final count within 
15 minutes. He made his entry in a small notebook and then more elaborate entries in a ledger which could be inspected by anyone. In his small notebook, he entered only the cash that came in after 6 o'clock out of the smaller jacques. This cash was in an independent category. He views it as free cash, whatever that might mean, a sort of immaculate conception, self-generated, arising out of itself and entitled to survive without reference to any tax. It was converted into crisp currency at the earliest moment, tied into a bundle and put away and put away to keep company with the portrait of Miss the Noble in the loft at home. Sheldon gave a final look at the cash in the drawer, lugged it carefully, tugged the handle four times and pushed his chair back with a lot of noise. He put a huge brass lock on the door, turned the key and put it in his pocket and said captain see if the lock is all right the captain says the lock in a matter grip as if it were a hand gra granite and gave it a final shirk this is a very strong lock sir can't get in nowadays i know about locks this must have been made in a village foundry. He expatiated on a world of locks and locksmiths. Jargon cut him short with, well, be watchful. The captain gave him a military salute, and that was the end of the day. End of chapter 1